My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the David Summerfleck podcast. My guest today is Daniel Chan. Daniel is, I, I don't know how to otherwise say it, a fantastic corporate magician who, uh, despite COVID or perhaps because of it, has really, really gotten on top of marketing in a brilliant way. Uh, Dan has worked with Airbnb, Apple, Bank of America, uh, BuzzFeed, Charles Schwab, one of my favorites, uh, Chevron, Cloudflare, eBay, Facebook, the Ritz Carlton, uh, Radio Disney, Yahoo, I didn't even know they were still open, uh, Twitter, Visa, Sony, PlayStation, and many, many others. Dan can be found online at danchanmagic.com. Dan, how are you doing today? I'm doing excellent. Well, thank you for taking some time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. As I said, uh, Dan is a magician, but of all the people that I've met and, and talked to and you know, well over 20, 25 years in marketing and working with small business owners, Dan has got to be on, on top of his marketing game, unlike so many, many others. And I really want to give you props for that. And, and I want to get into that with my questions too, because you're a very unique, uh, interesting dude. So let's get started with the beginning. How did you get started exactly? I know you worked for PayPal before they became a publicly traded um, IPO on the New York Stock Exchange in a customer service role. So how did you go from that? And then what caused you to eventually go more into magic and performing? I first had inklings of magic just by ma buying magic books at the bookstore. I would watch David Copperfield and I would watch a couple of magicians at a couple of theme parks. I think I might have seen one in Florida and one in the Santa Clara area, but those were just small moments. You'd remember it and you'd be awed by it, but it wasn't really until I went to Misdirection's Magic Shop on 9th and Irving where the owner Joe Pond introduced me to a plethora of knowledge. He had books, DVDs, and I ended up spending a lot in my secondary education at the Magic Shop. Okay. I, I do remember, I hope you didn't have the red sponge balls. D did you ever see those? <laughs> In fact, they're yes. on my Yes. Right oh my God. I, I, I do something called, um, I do this effect where one person does not see the effect and everyone else sees the effect with the sponge balls. It, it, instead of the classic in your hand where I intuitively feel like anyone can figure out the sponge balls if they're halfway smart. Yeah. So it's not like it's not like my A material, but for some reason it still gets great reactions, but I feel subconscious like about it because I'm like if I am charging X, which I am now, like I'm charging top dollar, I wouldn't be doing sponge balls to be honest with you. I'll, right. I'll do it if there's a kid there and I'll carry it. This is what I would call my commando act. If I lost all my props, I would you, I would get a pair of sponge balls and I would do this uh, routine called paper balls over the head where the one audience member does not see what happens, but everyone else sees it. And they're like, how can they not see it? And that to me is a lesson in one perspective. Mm. And the other is it's not just about, quote, magic. It's about the full experience that everyone else is feeling. So how did you go from 
performing. I think you were doing children's parties and then transitioning more into corporate events. How did that that evolution come about? I would see top name magicians who did pickpocketing and other differentiators. In marketing, you need to think about SWOT and analysis and yeah. Porter's five forces. There's a switching cost. If people can switch, they will switch. They're going to often choose the cheaper option. Yeah. So when I added juggling three flaming torches and picking pockets, that made me different than most magicians. So I could charge a premium. But then once I started realizing the power of celebrity and credibility, I was in the same level and beyond doing a lot less. I don't do a lot of fire juggling anymore. Even the pickpocketing, I don't sell that as like a main reason why they hire me. They might realize that I do it, but when you have those differentiators, it's just those little things. In the beginning, it almost feels a little bit gimmicky, mm -hmm. but I feel that it has a place, especially in the early career of any business, you first need technical chops. There's great marketers who sell themselves first, but if you have no technical basis, you're selling, <laughs> you, you, you don't have much to sell. So no, I agree. I agree. Technical chops. Yeah, I agree 110% because that's basically, that's what I had to learn. I mean, in marketing, I had the technical capability, but then once I had the technical capability, I realized I had to learn how to talk to clients about what are the real costly problems are you having that I could solve? So, I mean, I guess for you, the problem is, I need high quality entertainment that, that's unique. Yeah, a lot of what's out there is cheesy magic. Like you said, sponge balls, but everyone's yeah. doing sponge balls. Then why would I hire you who also does a sponge ball? So that's why I don't do the sponge balls for the most part. I carry them as my backup. And if I get heckled, I might do the sponge ball routine with a thing where no one sees it. But it's more about, it's like a safety blanket. But for the most part, you really want to differentiate yourself from your average Joe magician. And that's that's one of the things I really wanted to wrap my head around with you, with the um, your really magic, uh, for lack of a better adjective, way of, of marketing and promoting and sustaining this is, is a real viable business for you and your family and how you're able to get them all in there. So how are you able to get so much publicity? I read about how you successfully pitched BuzzFeed uh, in 2016, then MSNBC. How did you learn to do that with PR? Did you have help? And then how were you able to pitch successfully? I will tell you some of my secrets after our recording uh, because okay. there's one or two really, really valuable secrets in there that I only share with very close friends. And that is part of the competitive advantage. But um, in general, I realized that he who tells the best story in life wins. So I had rich stories, including stories that would position myself as a renaissance person. I just don't right. do a trick for you because if I just did a trick for you, then I'd run out of tricks. And you know, as a marketer, many of um, these people who are listening already know how to talk to their audience. But I have stories of me eating rattlesnakes in Catalina, swallowing a salmon heart while it's still beating and skydiving and bungee jumping and cliff jumping and doing all these other things. But, I've done those things so when someone talks about it, I have a segue where I can kind of integrate it. But it's not about me or, or what Dan has done, but I can I can kind of squeeze that in there and just once in a conversation. In fact, in my newest virtual show, I have this routine called Yes, No, Get to Know. And we get to know the audience members, but I nail it every time. But I ask them ahead of time, what's the most adventurous thing you've ever done? throw that in the chat bar. But you'll never feel that in a Copperfield or Lance Burton. And those guys are great. I love them. But I wanted to take magic in a direction that no one else did. I did not want to copy them. But I had to take in something personal, so personal that even if you did that trick, 
No one would have those same experiences of eating a salmon heart. And I'm asking David, would you eat a salmon heart while it's still beating? Um, and I would ask them that and I would say, I would show them these yes or no cards. Mm. Then I would commit to it. So David, would you eat a salmon heart while it's still beating? No. See, that's interesting that you said no, because I have the no card right there. So in these instances, it becomes more about not me being right, but about the team members getting to know David. Right. And that is the marketing solution. I do really strong magic, but I also incorporated one or two things that no one else did. And that is why people hire me because they can hire this other magician and they can still hire me and we can both prosper. But if everyone is copying and doing the same routine, it's like, what makes them different? And often it was people were separated by distance. They go to Vegas and only watch one magic show and they they would they they would only see a magic show every three years maybe five or ten years or whatever it was in the buying cycle so it didn't matter that they were seeing a generic copy because they didn't know but for me to perform for these billionaires that I perform for often they seen everything they can have Copperfield they can have Lance Burton in fact one of the guys who um, was with me at a party he was like oh I hired David Blaine I'm like cool. And then well, his friend was like, I saw him, a, a David Blaine. You're better than David Blaine. And it, that's that's a little bit of a far stretch because David Blaine is in his own league. But for a client to say that to you, that is amazing. That yeah. really validates the direction that you're going in. What kind of, I mean, I wanted to ask you about drive because the reality is there are plenty of magicians out there who are doing bar mitzvahs, as you well know, and a lot of them really could not transition during COVID. They're so used to doing the in-person physical shows. How were you able to really emotionally, intellectually, creatively make the transition where you can work remotely 100% if you want to, when so many other people, including most businesses, are still trying to figure it out. Yeah, it was all about minimum viable product, and then increasing the level, I believe, first in doing lots of volume, or a decent number of, I actually took it to way extreme where sometimes volume would make it so that quality suffered in the beginning. But I've done 370 virtual shows and we are on May 25th recording this today, uh, uh, 2021. And the pandemic started in March of last year. So I close to did an average of one show a day since the beginning of COVID. And in December I did 12 shows in a day, 52 shows in a week. That was my record. And you can't beat experience. If something's gone wrong, it's probably going to go wrong earlier on. So for the people who are like, oh, I'm only going to do $5,000 shows or I'm only going to do X, their shows, I'm sorry, I, I have to say, <laughs> they suck in comparison because they've I know some people who are like celebrity magicians or other people that who are really holding back on the volume that they're doing. And now they're playing catch up. And there's something to be said about a first mover advantage. And there's also something to be said in a, in terms of a last mover advantage. I was slow on the tech because I wanted to focus on the show. And I only recently, early January, upgraded to this Sony ZV-1 which is a superior camera than my laptop cam. And now I'm like, wow, I filmed all this stuff. I have to refilm everything. But there, but there was an advantage because sometimes you go first, sometimes you go last. You just have to figure out what you're going to focus in at and when you're going to focus on it. Now, I mean, how did you get the marketing, the marketing knowledge to position yourself? You found a niche that works for you. Um, you found a way to promote yourself that works for you. You learned how to piggyback as PR pretty effectively. 
So, I mean, did you get that experience from working at PayPal or some other way or just through trial and error or from I, reading? I love reading, but I also love studying everything around me. For example, I love at one time studying luxury brands because I knew that I wanted to perform for billionaires. So I would go into these stores and I would watch their demeanor. And I would watch how slowly they would walk up to you or how much space they would give you. And when you're working for very, very high profile people, it's not about a buffet. It's more about the quality. Like I love going to Michelin rated restaurants. In fact, I just, uh, I used to work at one or, or I worked at several. I just booked an event uh, for me and my wife, a date at Californios, which is a two star Michelin restaurant for next month. Because I'm, I'm passionate about fine dining. And I'm passionate about quality. So when I go to these places, I'm studying demeanor, I'm studying all the little details and appreciating it because those are the same things my clients appreciate. Well, let me ask you, do you use a type of system or tested process to reach out to journalists um, in order to get this repeat coverage? I have to ask. Yeah, um, I, I used to do it manually through LinkedIn. Then I did LinkedIn Sales Navigator, and now I use Scalex.ai. Hmm. Okay. Um, let me ask you, do you or did you use SEO at any time? And for anybody listening, if you don't know what SEO is, it's how you outrank competitors online. How did you determine the best way to market yourself to a very specifically preferred clientele base? Because that's what you're doing. Obviously, local SEO probably wouldn't be a good idea. So, I mean, you had tech industry experience and startup connections probably before transitioning. But how did you connect those dots exactly to make that leap? And did you know the potential uh, risks? Um, <laughs> there weren't a lot of potential risk. I, I realized that I could reverse engineer a lot, but I wouldn't copy my competitors in my space. I would copy other spaces. I would take things from other spaces and apply it to my space, which gave me a first mover advantage. I copied this website source code that was on the top of Google. And I didn't even realize what I was doing. I, I, I was just like, oh, what does this mean? And I would just Google the things. And I would look Google meta tags, meta descriptions. Yeah, I used to do tags. that too. And I was on the top of Google. But the thing is, I didn't understand that design experience. But then I also now know how to coach people to get major media mentions. Because if you're in Business Insider twice last year, like myself, CNBC twice, uh, I'm going to have my third Business Insider article coming out, upcoming soon, like probably within uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, we were in Voyage LA, SF Gate, BuzzFeed. I don't need SEO. That's True. What, SEO is a low level. It, it's everyone talks about oh, SEO, but when you become either a celebrity or you become mainstream, like I would consider myself kind of like a B less magic celebrity, right? But if you hit that level, it's still infinitely better than SEO. You don't even need SEO if you understand how to pitch journalists or have a story because people feature you on their podcasts and they're giving you SEO page rank or mm -hmm. other articles are driving so much traffic. Even if it's no follow from a major source, the volume that comes through, it doesn't matter because people end up booking you even if it's a no follow and you, and that's SEO, right? All the rules are broken when you hit a different level. Yeah, because I mean, one of the problems I remember when I started uh, back in the, the mid to late nineties, it was really easy to kind of cheat with SEO um, the, because back then we had Yahoo, Excite, Dogpile, yep. I think, maybe Alta Vista and uh, the internet was still relatively new and now you got everybody and their kid brother with a website whether they have a business or not so you really have to think in kind of an unconventional way and focus more on the content 
Yeah, so, I remember keyword stuffing. We uh, a lot of people did yeah, that. Yeah, that I worked. Did very, uh, I did it for a very short time, but once you realize, hey, it it worked, and it really got you on the top. But the thing is, then Google got smart to it. Then you yeah. had to be ahead of the game, and you had to switch and pivot. And those things still work to some extent in in certain industries, but there are definitely newer ways of getting on the top of the engine or getting more traffic in, in in fact i would argue it's not about seo it's more about traffic because seo drives their traffic search engine is where you become discovered but if you're being discovered through other th- mentions you don't need it there's substitutes right. to that but people right. always talk seo because everyone is a seo expert once everyone is there it's worthless right yeah, it's, well, I mean, the, the the thing with Google now is they change their algorithm every six months, maybe more. So, yeah, it's absolutely true. The only way to really stay on top of it, I mean, there's what you could do with SEO, but at the end of the day, it's about producing really substantive uh, content and cultivating your market, like what you're doing with PR. Um, let me let you... Let me ask you how you come up with new magic. And then I also want to ask you about bringing your family into the equation more. Yeah, I love watching other magic shows, but I want it when I do something, I'm inspired, but I'll never take a trick and do it exactly the way they do it. I see it and I'm like, how, how can I perform it to the person who showed it to me and them saying, oh, I didn't copy it. In the beginning, I made that big mistake and I wish I started thinking this creatively because it just got me better clients. Because if you're gold versus silver, gold is 1600 or 1800 in the price, silver is like in the low, less than 100. There's a massive difference. If someone can afford the best, they're going to hire the best. So why copy? If you have a differentiator, that's going to really allow you to, you know, attack it with a blue ocean strategy. Yeah. Let me ask you how you're able to, how you're able uh, to bring in your family into this. Cause I've seen some things where you have your son involved and he's doing uh, performances as well. And how are you able to do that? How do you bring them into the day-to-day activities? Homeschool. That was my son, James. He's been homeschooled. This is his second year homeschooled. We travel a lot. I want to see the t-shirt. Hold still. I want to see the t-shirt. Okay, 50% ninja. That's cool. 50% genius. That's even more cool. 100% hustle. Okay. Can you do the hustle? Um, Actually, when I mean hustle, we have you heard of the three shell game? Okay. My dad taught me how to do that in the three card Monty. He's a little suspicious in that aspect. Yeah. So it's, I used to go out with my son street performing because I knew I wanted him to do what I did. So at age five, he was juggling three balls at age um, eight. He was juggling five balls by age 10. He was juggling three flaming torches and even juggling uh, and even picking pockets by age 12. He had two national television appearances on, on his credit. Well, he's and definitely high energy. Call. Yeah. And that elevator pitch I knew he was going to do, but I just didn't know when he was going to do it. You know, like I I knew that was going to be early on and I pushed and I pushed. And in the beginning, it was so hard. I remember these days where, where I remember bringing my dad in the back of the van we had. We had this minivan. My wife would nurse my son and then she'd perform even do some acrobatics and come back. We would do level level acrobatics. And it was so tough because on our weekends, we'd just be driving and on the road. But I had a long-term vision and many people in my family doubted me because they're saying, oh, don't get your son to do this. Don't push, don't do this. And he loves what he's doing now. But everyone said no, because everyone said no, I had to really analyze and say, will this work? And I had to work hard to, to really validate. And I'm not just dreaming because 
I had these milestones. Well, he's juggling three balls. This is good at this time. Oh, he's juggling three flaming torches. This is going to be good. Why don't we pitch television producers? They're going to say yes. I had everything very systematically planned out in terms of like from a long term. Sometimes I'd make small mistakes because I was moving too fast. But now I'm trying to look for investors and I'm trying to get to the next level so I can have a venue where people come to see me. And that's where I'm mm. looking five or 10 years out. I'm looking for people with money who are like, Dan, you executed on all this PR. We know that you're going to get the PR right. Now we've seen all your competitive advantages. Now we see your system and how you're training other people. When I'm studying other business models more so than even doing magic, I'm adding less magic, but when I do add it, it's a part of a product cycle. It's kind of like Apple. They roll out their products. They change their laptops one year majorly. Then they'll change something, uh, one major change. Mm -hmm. But most magicians I see, they have no product cycle. They buy a thing and then they, they don't, they just change it even before anything else has been changed. I mean, even before they implement what they previously bought. Now what I'm doing is I write the script often even before the trick is done or even before I purchase the effect or hire the consultant. I picture it out and that is the power of vision, being able to see what the end goal looks like and then getting rid of all the mm. other crap that's in the way. Like in, right now I'm in the process of selling a lot of my DVDs and books and other things to magic students because that old thought process can only get you so far. Right. Well, let me just ask you, I only have a few more questions for you. You definitely know marketing in a very, very competent way. Would you have any advice for a business owner out there who is struggling, whether it's due to the economy, whether it's due to COVID, whether it's due to some external factor, even an internal factor? And I would say that, hey, what does this have to do with magic? But you know an awful lot about it. There's a lot of pain points. And the problem is you have to find people who are successful in the area that you've already been in and then pay the price to work with them. But the problem is there's so many people who are, you know, these gurus or these people that you're, that are kind of questionable sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I studied from guys I wanted to be like that were actually doing the work and not faking it. So like I can tell you certain aspects that will transfer over, but I'm not an expert in certain industry parts. The marketing part's easy. The part that's hard is getting something so good that it almost sells itself that when you pitch a journalist, they say yes. The problem is most people don't have that hook, but that means you have to go back to the drawing board to not be the marketer, but to focus on that technical skill. The heart before the marketing or hone the marketing so well that the copywriting is ages above everything else. The copywriting pushes you that extra 10%. Yeah. The, the image pushes you that extra 10%. But we're not just looking for beautiful people. If, if it was all about that, we'd all be models, right? Because if you're saying to be the prettiest or to be the greatest, you have to have a technical skill. Yeah. Well, yeah. At the end of the day, it's all about the substance that you bring to uh, whatever it is that you do. Well, let me just ask you, um, where can people see you perform and how? Well, we'll throw that in the show notes. I have an online Airbnb experience and also I'm on, on Zoom. So if you go to millionairesmentalist.com, millionaires plural, you can see videos of me performing, but even better would be to experience the show live because the future of magic is virtual because it's global. So there's going to be a lots of things that you're going to be seeing a lot of new celebrities coming up through the platform of zoom or whatever video conferencing, um, app is popular and this trend of virtual magic will not go away. So Google Dan Chan business insider, pivoting magic to zoom and you'll find that business insider article about the steps that I took to reinvent myself in zoom. Also 
The Hustle wrote an article about me, which went out into 2 million inboxes. Um, it got emailed to 2 million plus people in one weekend. And that kind of jump started my career. So I'm, I'm forever thankful to, for the guys uh, at The Hustle, Zachary Crockett. He wrote that article on me, uh, which was the first positive article because the first article of 2020 was a negative article, which I incidentally pitched to CNBC. And I told them I lost $8,000 in one week. And there was nothing good about that, but it's sometimes just about getting PR and it's not even about the quality of it. I was just being transparent and said, hey, I lost money. I didn't know where I was going to go with it. And then the next step was, hey, this is what happened. This is how much I lost. Would you like to hear what was different? And I just, I, I, I had this vision of what became better. And people want to hear that hero's journey, the story. No yeah. one wants to just see you, oh, I, I got here. They want to hear how you got there because once they hear that, they can follow those steps, step by step, move by move. A lot of these principles can be transferred to other business owners. Absolutely. Well, Dan, I only have one more question for you. What is next on the horizon for you and your family? Um. One more year of homeschooling, then the kids are going to go back to high school so that they can have a normal childhood. <laughs> uh, this is going to be our third year, so we're going to ski a little bit. We're also considering unscripted reality. I told you I won a documentary. I won mm. the Pinnacle Film Festival Award and the Telly Awards, which we just found out about today, the Telly Awards. Um, so that might be a longer-term goal. That may take three or five years but the more time you put into that the better the results gonna be like the mm -hmm. documentary we just did was short 15 minutes on budget but i i feel like we're gonna learn uh we already started acting classes with james and i'm sometimes jumping on those acting classes because communication is such an important part i feel like i have the communication 90 percent there and I need to polish that last 10% to make it on a level that we can get to a global scale. And it's all about scale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I really, really appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, for anyone watching or listening, I want to thank you for your time. And once again, to learn more about Dan, just visit danchanmagic.com. And... If you would like to submit a question for our business episodes where we take listener questions, please go to dms.blue slash podcast guest. You can also apply to be a guest there as well. So thank you very much and look forward to meeting you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. I really appreciate it. To learn more about the podcast or where to find episodes or how to apply to be a guest or submit a question, just go to www.dms.blue slash podcast. Thanks again and hope to meet you in the next episode.